and welcome to another week of Backstage with Cooper and Maddie Johns. Matthew, how are you feeling? Have you recovered yet? We're a couple weeks on now. Well, we're three weeks on now from Vegas. Have you recovered? I recovered the moment we landed. I was fine. Once I pushed the ice in the back of my head to the front, I was fine. By the time we landed in Mascot, I was as good as gold. Good to see you finally get out of your dressing gear. Yeah, I... It's taken me a while. It's taken me a good two weeks. Well, you're doing the early mornings breakfast radio. Yeah. That's, it's very, very hard to catch up after that. Yeah, I've been playing like really, like it's, I've just been playing catch up, like mm. you just said. I'm still playing catch up in the eight years I did breakfast radio. Really? Yeah. It's funny because you always used to whinge back then and now and I'm now doing you, it. And now, I, you, <laughs> now you know why I used to whinge. Yeah, I know. I do know why. Hey, uh, our guest today, we've got very special guest, David and Candace Warner, mm. uh, which will be a very good interview. What Have you met the guys before? Have you met them? I interviewed Candace last year. Yeah. She's a champ. Tough, man, tough, tough, tough. T- comes from a tough working class family. Um, South Sydney supporters. Uh, Are Dave- they both South Sydney supporters? No, no, no. This is interesting. Dave's a rooster supporter. Is he? I wonder, like, that relationship when those two when those two play each other. Yeah. And they've got, they got three kids. They've got the girls, too. I wonder, I wonder how that works yeah. out. Yeah. Well, for those that don't know, if we've got cricket fans listening, that's the biggest rivalry in the rugby league, if not sport. Australian sport. Is it... A, is it- no, is that the biggest? In I think sport? so. Yeah. Is there another Australian sport rather than like um, ball sport outside of cricket and, and rugby league? Are there any other sports apart from rugby league and cricket in Australia? Not really. No. <laughs> so it's the biggest rivalry in Australian sport. Um, I met Dave in the mid two thousands. I think it was Brad McNamara who played Sheffield Shield for Australia. He was at my sideline producer on Friday Night Football, and it was the Broncos versus the Roosters, I think, and he said, I'm bringing a young guy to the game, a young cricketer. I reckon he'll be a very, very good player, probably play for Australia one day, and sat in the sideline with us. It was Dave. He was only a young guy. Wow. Mm. Wow, what the hell? Did you meet him since then? Or is yeah, that... yeah. I've ran into him a couple of times Yeah, okay. here and there. So... I can understand why they're married. They're, they're very, very similar. They're both street fighters. They're both both tough. Dave Dave went to Matraville uh, Boys High. Um, Adam Reynolds came from there. The Yellow Brothers uh, of Rugby Union fame. A lot of really good sportsmen came out of Matraville. Lots and lots. Yeah. Um, t- I, it's a tough area. I can imagine it'd be a competitive household. I think so. Do you know what I mean? They'd yeah. be very competitive. Unlike you and Trish up there, when Trish tells you something, there's no pushback. I reckon there'd be just, there'd be lots of pushback. That Mediterranean fire. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, uh, they've just come through the door, so let's uh, get into the interview. Let's do it. Avoid don't embarrass me. Now, Candice, yes. do you have a brother? Yes, I've got two brothers. Is your brother's name Patrick? Oh, uh, what's he done? Well, I just, uh, yeah, about half an hour ago, yeah. he messaged me on Instagram. Oh, for fuck's sake. And, uh, and he said, hey, mate, you're interviewing my sister today. She has a few nicknames. We've got to point out, too, this is we have started the interview. Okay. Yep. Oh yeah, yeah. We just didn't want to be one of those. Nice, yeah. Just didn't want to be those <laughs> people that do that. Yeah. Uh, lollies. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, as obviously Candace yes. Candy. Yeah. That's I got that one. The thigh master. Oh uh, yeah. So yeah, once I I was doing a. It was like a at home gym thing that was called the thigh master. And anyway, is that yeah. like one of those bad infomercials? Abs- where- yeah, it's exactly what it okay, is. Okay, like you yes. got a you got a door, you have a gym. Yeah, and it's really good. You just can just slip it under your bed when you finish with it. Yes. Yeah, yeah, they're they're all bullshit. Those ones. Yeah. And ask her about the time she fell flat on her face riding a skateboard down the side path and nearly took half her face off. Yeah, that, well, that's true. Uh, two older brothers, so just wanted to be just like them growing up. For Christmas, Santa bought them a skateboard, so I wanted a skateboard, and um, yeah, I was just riding it, not knowing what I was doing, and just down the side path, just launched into the concrete, just full on scabs galore, bleeding everywhere, and that was the end of my skateboarding career. But yeah, yeah. that's what happened. I push that closer, mate. These microphones are a bit sensitive. Okay. Sorry, Candice. Yeah. Your experience is so backstage, yeah. <laughs> uh, back uh, page. Um, now, people may think this is unusual me asking you this question first, Candice, but people who know who have played professional sport know that the pressure of it all impinges most on the, the loved ones. When Dave announced his retirement from Test cricket. Was the primary emotion relief? Oh, without a doubt. Um, yeah, it was 
not sad, not a moment of sadness at all. It's something that I think David was ready for. I might be wrong. Um, but no, just definitely relief because I see my husband and, and not a lot gets to him, but the scrutiny throughout the years has been immense. And I never, you know, I don't want to see my husband go through what he's been through and just so constant, like it just never let up. So for us, it was relief. But at the same time, that also meant a hell of a lot more cricket, mm. which is probably people don't realise that. They just think, oh, he's retired from test cricket. He's going to be home a lot more, but that's not the case at all. I mean, this is a, mm. a rarity, but after this, I think he's going to be away for almost four or five months. Um, like I remember Alan Border used to sit and when like tense moments, he'd sit there and they said that no one was allowed to leave their seat and everything. Did you have superstitions? When Dave's going into a big game, needs a big score, or he's sitting on in the nineties. Did you have a super? Were you superstitious? Did you? Um, not really. And I was always very relaxed watching Dave until the Ashes in two thousand and nineteen, when Stuart Broad was just getting him out for fun. Um, <laughs> and then after that, sorry, darling. And then fun. after that, um, I was basically a nervous wreck. I, I couldn't watch cricket after that. That took the enjoyment out of cricket for me. Um, but no, never really any superstition because David's not superstitious. And yeah, right. Really? No. And there was times where he would give me sig certain signals when he was out on the field. He would kind of just give these little signals to me. And that's when I knew that he was on. He was relaxed and I knew he was going to make a big score. Yeah. Right. When you say no, have you, is that no superstitions now that, you know, you got into the back end of your career or is that no superstitions ever? No. I, well, if you want to call it a, su a superstition, you can, but... I would never have ducked the night before a game. But I, it's not a superstition. It was just more like, I was just like, oh, I'm not going to do it. Because one of the boys, I mentioned it to him. We're in um, Peter Forest. We're in England. And we're at a Chinese restaurant. And he goes, stuff it. I'm ordering the Peking duck. First ball next game. <laughs> Bold Necron Crop, and he walked off and goes, I'm not fucking having another okay. Peking duck ever again. Here's a question <laughs> If you go to the Golden Century, you never Peking duck. I mean, does that mean you get a 50? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's probably the only place you probably or could you get have. a Golden Duck. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, yep. here's some bit of trivia Walt Disney was a huge cricket fan, went to Headingley, the only time to watch Donald Bradman play. Donald Bradman got a duck. And that's where he got the name Donald Duck from. Because And evidence of that, if you look at like Wikipedia Donald Duck, what his middle name is, is the company that used to produce the baggy green. Are you kidding me? No. Well, wow. Where are you? How and what's you? the company that produced the baggy green? Sensing this is a poor No, no, I swear to God. Well, I know, I've got not? some trivia, but it's got mm. nothing to do with cricket. Do you know why the Tim Tam is called the Tim Tam? No. Because Mr. Arnott went over to the Kentucky Derby in whatever year it was, and the winning horse was called Tim Tam. And then he wanted a name for his new chocolate biscuit, so he named it Tim Tam. Wow. What the hell? Never been to the Kentucky Derby. They say it is insane. Is that in Kentucky? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I walked straight into that one, yeah. Dave. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Dave, Dave, you're going to continue like 2020 cricket. We're, what You're going to play... Uh, only IPL, would you play in the Caribbean League? Yeah, IPL um, first and potentially there's a few leagues in that time after the World Cup. You've got a Sri Lankan Premier League, the new MLC, the American League. Oh, you. Yeah. Uh, it's Major League Cricket and then you've got the 100 in, in England and then you have the Caribbean. So there's four leagues in a matter of probably eight weeks um, that you can participate in. But that's me going into that where all these other guys have been playing this for the last sort of five, six years, especially all the West Indian guys, I don't know how they fit any spare time in. Mm. Like even thinking about it and trying to juggle it, like for me, it wouldn't be possible to play a lot of them because when you retire, you retire for a reason. It has to have time mm. at home and, and chill out. Do so. you have a favourite of all of those that you like playing? Look, I think, do you choose which best holiday destination you want to go to? Mm. Or do you want to go there and... Like, I'm, I'm passionate about winning and... Um, I think you also want to go to places where you're going to have your friends that you've played with alongside, whether it's the IPL, the Australian teammates, um, and some of the English boys that you've played with. So I think you can slide into those teams by judging that 
um, yourself and, and looking forward. A lot of guys are retiring now as well, so that could be an option. What's camaraderie like in the like IPL and that those homogenized sides? Like you know, like you got different people people from yeah you know, England, South Africa, India, Pakistan. Camaraderie pretty good. Yeah, it's it's good. It's it's changed since when it when I first started there in two thousand nine. Um, I think what's getting harder is international cricket because everyone's sharing their own ideas. So when we come up against um, whether it's England or or New Zealand currently, you 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 having these conversations about how you guys try and get me out or how do you bowl to me we're in a team meeting and um xyz comes up on the meeting and go this is how we bowl to them okay so when we play you guys i know that's how you're going to bowl to steve smith and then i'm going to say steve this is what they're talking about you and this is how they're trying to get you out so you're actually working it's working for you and against you in a way when you're playing against each other and with each other that, that's interesting because i remember the war brothers steve and mark they would keep a dossier on dossier and all the opponents and they knew how to so a guy walks to the crease say graham hick and i said right get into him talk and it'll unsettle him viv richards walks to the crease don't say a thing just leave him alone that that's interesting to that to know understand the nuances of all opponents no most definitely and i know the back end of my career no one said a thing to me out in the middle they didn't no nah. and so i had to try and get myself into a contest somehow so i would sort of if I hit a boundary, I'd go past the bowler and just say, "Shot, mate." <laughs> uh, you just have, you have to get you have to get something, and even if they turned around and they looked at you, you just knew, okay, I've got him, I've got him listening now. Mm. Yeah, well, that's very much like rugby league, like you talk about. Like, how would you know? Well, because I, <laughs> I don't know if you realise, I used to play it actually, uh, but like blokes that would go to Origin and things like that, and then come back and would give dirt on opposing players that you would play against that week. Like, oh, he likes to do this and things like that. So. Very similar that stuff. Was a, that was always a really, it's a big point, state of origin sides, where they, they'd share ideas. The New South Wales blokes would share ideas on you know, different things. They were in the Queensland blokes, no. Nah, don't, yeah. don't, don't give anything away on opponents. Mm. While we're on India, do you guys like India? Do you guys like travelling to India, going there? I, re I really enjoy it. I think what people um, don't understand is how humbling the experiences and i think you get a lot of um i get a lot of satisfaction going over there and, and helping um with with cricket and then what comes with that is meeting people um in and around cricket so you meet sponsors you get to go to um you know orphanages you get to go to um, some schools you get to meet underprivileged people who aren't fortunate and for me it's an eye-opener but i can actually help out in many ways and cricket is the, the biggest thing cricket puts smiles on people's faces and over there as soon as you they see a cricket player the smile is you know from ear to ear and and it's it's really humbling um mm. and the girls like when they go over there they they do the same thing they, they love it and they ask questions they ask why is there so many people in the streets why mm. why is there little kids running around with no clothes on and and we've got to you know explain to them what what it's like over there and they've sort of like they're feeling it more now because they're older they didn't they didn't know about that um back in the day but yeah they're really getting an understanding of it all candace like dave can you guys just in india go out in public um i can <laughs> um it, it's a little bit easier when sort of david stays at the hotel and i take the girls out which i try to do because it's really important that they learn about the indian culture and whether it be just going down to a market and using the currency or getting a tuk-tuk there and that's really important for me that they experience it, not just stay in the hotel and, and then go to the cricket. Um, but so we can, it's a little bit difficult because the girls are, um, our little one's blonde. They just want to touch her. And, and uh, I think it's, it's, it's almost good luck if you, if there's a little white child with blonde hair and blue eyes, and if you get to touch them, it's, it's good luck. So that can be a little bit confronting. When we're with Dave, it's, it's a different story because they're, they're so fixated on David and they're oblivious that he might be with his kids. At times it can be frightening. Mm. Um, and it's not just one or two people. It can be hundreds of people um, and in a matter of a minute. So Virat Kohli, what's his life like? Oof. Cannot go outside. Really? If he was to go outside, he would have to have plenty of security, um, extra security. And, and now that he has... Um, you know, two two kids and with his wife, with um, her background as well, 
it would be very, very difficult for him to leave. He would need full escorts. Um, and I think, I, I don't know the top, top, top of my head, but he was looking at somewhere in the countryside in, in India to have a farm place. And I think a few of them do have some farm places where they can just chill out mm. um, and relax. But generally, a lot of them in their downtime would go overseas. Um, I know he bought in England recently. And it's their escape. Because it is... It, it, uh, like, okay, we saw Taylor Swift. Like... Mm. He is probably, if not bigger than Taylor Swift, when it comes to sporting geniuses, um, especially in India, but everywhere in the world. We um, even look at Emma Stoney. He walks around with armed security everywhere he goes, even on his own home. Is just, I think there's up to twenty or thirty armed officers guarding his home. I believe Emma Stoney, because like uh, similar to England, it can be a hierarchical sport. Is he a working class boy, like uh, Emma Stoney? Someone told me that he's. Like, he's in the um, he person. He's in the military himself, isn't he? He's yeah. always wanted to be in the military, I think, yeah, and he's right. trained with them. He's done everything with them. He loves everything to do with military. Yeah, right. Um, and that's where all the camouflage gear comes from. And yeah, he he loves it all. He loves all that stuff. It's funny you say that before because when we were in Vegas, we had like escorts <laughs> with us as well. <laughs> Is that what you call them? Yeah, yeah, yeah. and security guards as well. We had them too, um, <laughs> mate. <laughs> Your mother's. Just I know upset. she doesn't, she doesn't l- find that stuff <laughs> funny, but she also doesn't listen to our podcast yeah. as well. Bo- um, on Bollywood, have you ever been? Would you ever do like a Bollywood movie or a film? More Tollywood, which is South India. Yeah, um, Bollywood's north, um, but quite um, goes into like different uh, other countries around um, sort of Asia as well. Have I've I've been asked a couple of times, but just waiting for that right moment. Yeah, because if you if you if I get that opportunity, mm. you only get one chance at it. Yeah, and I don't want yeah, stuff right. up, so I'm going to make sure that's <laughs> I'm going to make sure it's the right one, the, yeah. the, the right sort of action movie. I think yeah. so. Yeah. I've got a crack at the movies once the final win. I've never been asked back. <laughs> I know what you're talking about preparation's everything. <laughs> it's got to be the right time. Let's uh, talk about preparation, Dave. Like, or oh, Candice, what's Dave like in preparation? I, like when I was a player, I was a real pain in the ass. Like Trish just hated it. Like, hard to talk to. Well, Dave is um, – a lot of players, if they sort of have a bad game or a bad innings, they come home and they bring it home with them. Mm. I don't think not once, even when he had a real bad run where it might have been quite a few games in a row where he didn't score a lot of games, it didn't affect him. Or it may he, – he, he certainly didn't bring it home and he certainly didn't show it to myself and the kids. Um yeah, he was always very good like that. Mm. And yeah, I don't think I ever mm. had to pull you up and say, hey, you know, it's a game, mm. leave it at the door, nothing like that. Because it's funny because Cooper, living here, um, he would often bring, if he had a bad game, he'd bring it home, which meant he was never happy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, his prep, David's preparation <laughs> was always, um, I would say... Gin and tonics? Yeah. Plenty of gin and tonics the night before. He didn't. He and he didn't let anything affect him. So, if something wasn't right, you know, sometimes he would have coke, uh, coca pops for breakfast. Sometimes he would have eggs. Other times, the night before, he would have macas. Or there was nothing, you know, that he mm. was. He wasn't that regimented with his preparation, other than his training and his workload. Well, that's what what a relief that is. Like yeah. I, when I, I was superstitious, I would collect them. Like coins, yeah. Two socks underneath oh, one that pair would be of socks, so two pairs annoying. of underpants. I'd see, like, pick up a piece of rope on the ground, play well, I carry my bag. Is that because you were looking for form? I think you're right. Yeah. <laughs> I think it was like you know, all of a sudden you have a good game and I'd carry coins around. Like, and actually, it becomes tougher than the game itself. You know, you're that, an overthinker though by nature. Like you overthink a lot, don't you? Well. Do you, what brings you to that conclusion? I don't know. I was just trying to help you to get there as well. Mm. Yeah. Do you think you, you were superstitious with your boys' careers? Like, do you feel like your superstitions, if if they had a good game, you if you did something, it's like, I better keep doing that. Candice, I was. <laughs> I was. I'd sit and the boys would do something good in a game and I'd say, tap my foot three times, things like that. It became oh really, God. like, it was really... It, Fucking what hard a pain work. In the yeah, we, yeah we had James Magnuson on this last week, and he spoke about a bloke that he used to swim with, and his superstition was 
he used to masturbate every time before he used to go out on the blocks. Oh, sh- no way. I, sw- I swear on my life. Gee whiz. Every single time. And then they were in, where was it? Sri Lanka one time. And they said the toilets were so dirty and he was just in there for like half an hour because he couldn't get himself. Isn't it? But I thought a lot of people, they, it was the opposite. So like some teams ban their players from having sex the night before because aren't you supposed to build that? Testosterone. Well, in, yeah. case you, in case you do your hips or something. Yeah, something no, like I don't that. know. I thought it was. <laughs> yeah, so, it was. It was. It was, not, it, was not, it was an old wise tar. Yeah. That, yeah. That it well, weakened. I've got a mate who, who has to edge ever before every game. Sorry. He edges, What's so that? he masturbates, but he doesn't get himself to the very oh, end. Harry Grant, you're a disgrace. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> don't name and shame him. But good luck, Harry. I, go, I was going to say with, with that, my old man don't condone this whatsoever. He used to um, walk around the field when he used to smoke. And would go through a whole packet, and then if he if he'd go, he'd be that nervous. He'd have to go go again. So he'd yeah. have a couple of packets in the side there. Well, you, when you were playing, when I was playing, yeah. yeah. It, Thankfully, they, they went cold turkey yeah. back when my brother had his first kid. So <laughs> there was a lot of smokes that he went through. Well, Dave, uh, Candice, if if the girls become cricketers or NRLW or something like that, I can guarantee playing yourself is easy. Competing yourself is easy. Your children. It is a nightmare. Like this NRL season, I'm looking forward to the most for years and years because they're not involved. Yeah. It's a nightmare. Yeah, because I suppose you ride the roller coaster with them. You just want the best for your child. Mm. And you see them putting in the effort week in and week out. How, well, ma- how mm. many F-bombs when he stuffed up? I, I, didn't, I, was pretty... I didn't stuff up oh, that oh, one. That's hilarious. <laughs> Thank you for your low standards. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I'll be here all night. No, <laughs> well, they. I always found it like Cooper always. I remember once they played against each other at Mudgee. You got the draw. Yeah, the draw, the which draw. was a rarity. And people were saying to me, in Mudgee, my grandma, my my mum's side of the family from Mudgee. And people were going, "What's going to happen in the game?" And I was saying to them, "It'll go to Golden Point, end up in a draw." And it did, right? Jack had a blinder. Cooper played okay. Just missed a couple of tackles. That's okay. We all do that sometimes. Yeah, I mean, Fifteen's not that many. I run and, in the family. And, yeah. <laughs> oh, Candace, how Thank dare you? Candace. you? <laughs> and, and I'm standing there and I'm saying to Jack, brilliant, well done. And then, mate, you, Jack and Coop's going, how do I go? Yeah, yeah no. Just, mate, good. You're going good. But the boys were like that. They said they couldn't come to me because I... What kind of father were you? Were you honest? Were you encouraging? Did, were you one that would yell out? Oh, I'd never yell out. No, no. No. Are was, you guys going to be like, are you guys going to be the yellers at your I was going to say, was that because no. of who you are? Because when we go to the girls, either tennis or soccer or netball, I only get frustrated at the netball. Yeah, right. Because they bunch oh, up so and they don't spread out. When it comes to Oztag and all that, I don't care if they bunch up. But when it comes to netball... It frustrates me because you explore, need space, right? Explore the space, girls. Get the ball and oh. spread out. Do you yell it out? Oh no, yeah, from the sideline. Oh, you he's do? a shocker I did. at netball. He's I, in, did. I had to say, listen. I stop. was like, girls, spread out. It's not hard. <laughs> it is not hard. Look at all the space on the court. I don't know netball from a bar or so, but just spread out. It's just common it makes sense, sense, girls. But then when they play cricket on a Saturday, he could not care less. He's sitting there just I don't going throw on, balls watching the races. Warm out. <laughs> I'm sitting down watching other parents throw the balls and get the balls from him like. I'm not getting involved in this. Oh, man. I tell you, when Cooper played cricket, what a nightmare. It was like, you know, basically four hours watching, you know, these 20 kids in white just bowling no balls and wides for oh, like... Oh, don't. That's yeah. where we're oh. at. It is so frustrating. Torture. They yeah. can't even get... The, a lot of the kids can't then haven't got the ability yet to get the ball even to the batter. Yeah, yeah they, haven't oh. got the, they haven't got the power. I was a spin bowler and I, did, I, I used to think I was really good. I, I got an award that said... Like congrats on the year, the spin king. So for like <laughs> spin me, king. yeah. So for years I thought I was this really good cricketer, and then I saw like a, a photo, like a video of it, and it didn't even spin. I was just throwing it so slow <laughs> that it like they couldn't call it a fast bowl. So it was just basically just. He was known as the Stuart McGill yeah. of the uh, Northern Beaches. <laughs> wow, what a rap! Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, maybe that's... Harry Grant might be a good wrist spinner. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry. Backhand. But we talk about like talk about like pressure in sport. Like, um, like before a big test, Dave. Like you know, how how would you how'd you feel before a big test or even a game where you go right? I need a big score here. Didn't care. Yeah, right. There's no. I don't. I don't ever feel pressure. Mm. I think for me, what happened at the back end, what Candice was talking about was. 
it all the focus started being on me and I'm about the team. So I'm trying to put my hand up to do the media because it's about the team. So we go back to England when I, I made the statement of uh, Sydney would be great. It would be fitting if I'm to get there, if I'm scoring runs, if I'm doing well. But I penciled in Lords as my finish because the, that's the second test. If I wasn't going well then, well, I might as well retire because mm. you know, at the end of the day, I wasn't scoring runs. I wasn't you know upholding my standards and I didn't want to let the team down. So that back end was all media about just me retiring. So for me, I think when you talk about pressure, the focus was on me, but I was just going out there and re- trying to reverse it as much as I could. So I sort of tried to play in the back of my mind that I'm done. So Sydney, that could, that's my farewell. That's in my mind. So that's how I'm going to think about it. And that's how you, you sort of you go out there and just, you can't emulate what you did previously if you did well. If you scored 100, you can't tell yourself, all right, let's get back into that moment. I had a, if there was a song in your head, you know, if you walked on the left side of the crease or whatever it was, whatever you did, your idiosyncrasies, you can't replicate that. You can't get back into that zone. So where does that come from, Dave? Because Cooper and I were talking before and he was asking about both you guys. And I said, like, they're tough, resilient. I said, Dave is a cricketer, is a street fighter. You know, you, you went to Matraville. Is that where it comes from, that working class background? Yeah, I, you know... When you when when you come from the working class background, how's the commission? And we had to sort of, you know, fight for everything basically. Like, if we went out and into the into the um, townhouses and we were playing footy or something, or someone took your ball, you had to chase after them and go and get it. Like there was no like just stopping and 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 waiting for it to give back to you. You had to actually f- pretty much fight for everything. Yeah. So, for me, it's always been that back up against the wall mentality and and moving forward. Mm. Um, and yeah, so I just never really cared about what people thought. If if someone does like say you know come out and put external pressure on you whether it's in the media or whatever, do you find even though it doesn't bother you, do you still find you use it to motivate yourself when it comes to game day? When I I wouldn't say I use it to motivate myself. I laugh because I'm saying you're wasting your breath. Yeah, you're, okay. you're wasting your breath on someone who genuinely doesn't care about what you're saying. Yeah, and then I'll just go out there and do my bit. And so it happens that yeah I might score the hundred in the first test in Perth. Um, and then that at that time, I had Post Malone in my head fall apart, mm. and um, <laughs> I was saying, <laughs> I was saying in the back of my mind that something's going to fall apart. <laughs> 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 so the whole thing, and and I had Charlie at the mic. I had the bib on at that stage when I was playing, and I felt sorry for him because I kept on whistling the whole for five hours I was whistling in his ear <laughs> and only Charlie knows all the information of what I was saying and man if that could be played one day down the track in 10 years time it'll be some interesting choice of words that I was talking to Charlie about <laughs> right a couple of scenarios I oftentimes think about like what it's like when you go into 20 minutes four stumps and you go in there Dave and at the end of the day's play you're three not out compared to your 110 end of day's play, Mm -hmm. which must, how different does that feel? I mean, obviously, is that one of the best feelings in cricket when you've got your century and you go back to the hotel and everything after that almost feels like a bonus? Yeah, 100%. I look back at my innings in Perth against uh, India. We bowled them out for 167. We had 23 overs to bat at the end of the day. Packed house, green wicket. I came out and just, I know I've seen the ball like a beach ball. They played four quicks, no spinner. And in Perth, when you're facing quicks and they drop it short of length, I'll play a pull shot. I'll you know try and hit the ball back over the bowler's head, and I don't know what it was. Something just gelled, and I um managed to score 100 and at 23 overs, and I think Ed Cowan was on about 15 or something at the other end. Mm. But that night, what you what you um, alluding to there is you want to go out, you want to celebrate it, yeah. but you can't. So you can't, day one of the okay. test match. So you can't. You, there's no, you can. Yeah, but then you got to bat the next day. Oh yeah. yeah okay. So it looked like if you went down and all of a sudden you're having two or three beers, peer pressure, not allowed to. What what's the what's the reaction? No, you can. No, you, you can. can? Yeah, okay. you can no, definitely. Like it's more relaxed these days because I think we're we're more of adults than back then. Mm. Um, so what like was it's the best example was in your hundredth test in Melbourne last year um, or the year before when I cramped. When you cramped, but that night before, you know, you just I think. 
David is such a social person. He loves having people around. He's not one of those people that will have Uber Eats in the room. He'll mm. always go out for dinner, always have, you know, one or two drinks. But he was in, everyone was down for his 100th test. It was just, you know, we were having a cake for you. You were just, he was just so relaxed. And I think even then you you knew that that next day you were going to go out and produce something pretty special. I think it was on 20 odd not out, I think. And it was um, at the end of the day. And I was, that was more like, I was like, okay, I survived the day. But that night was just, yeah, it was all family and friends down there. And I think I had triple cheeseburger, 10 nuggets and a couple of G&Ts. For an entree. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Dave, and, you said before, sorry to cut you off, you said before, really interested me. When you see it sometimes like a, a beach ball, other days you're out there, you see it like like a pea. Um, so that that's a real thing. Have you ever worked out why? Is it like just the, part of the human condition? or I think it's sometimes the time of the day as well. Um, you know, when you're when you're going out there at ten thirty in the morning, um, you wake up. You might be, you might have woken up a bit tired, um, and then you you know we're going to bowl first, but then we lose a toss in your batting. So your mindset has to change to, all right, we're batting first now. You've got half an hour to get ready, and then you go out there, and it might be a little bit bright at one end, and glare's a real thing. And I've I won't say suffered, but like with my my eyesight, I pick up glare quite easy, like quite easily. And you look like an absolute tosser if you're going to wear sunglasses when you're batting. Mm-hmm. You look like a rock star. <laughs> Only one person can do that, and that's, that's Chris Gale because he's the universe boss. <laughs> yeah. So I couldn't pull that off. But um, I've trained in glasses before, and I was like, this is a different ball game. Completely different ball game. But you, you, you're right. You, there, it's just certain times of the day. Um, and I, and I, yeah, you, sometimes you just know when you walk out there. You just go, I'm on. Like, you just know it. From maybe the first shot, um, I know... There's a percentage there. If I hit, um, if my first scoring shot's a boundary, I score, I don't know, 65%, 75%, hundreds. Or, you know, if I face the first ball rather than the next over. There's all these little things as well, but mm. you just know. Sometimes you just know when you're out there. And mm. as I said, I don't know how to get into that m- mojo. I don't just know how there. to get into it. It's hard. Otherwise, you'd be genius. Yeah, it's funny, isn't it? Like as a sportsman, I'm the best game I ever played, I'm coming back. And I'm running at Newcastle. We used to warm up across like a, a main, almost main highway. And uh, a lot of players used to nearly get run over. But we used to walk, I remember running back one day and I said, I know I'm going to play the game of my life. And uh, I didn't. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but you know, you just know. And it's hard, And you always search for that to go back. Um, yeah. we, we had a com- I had a conversation yesterday with um, uh, a few of the boys. Um, we're talking about um, when you're sick. Why are they your best games? It's strange. I know. And how do you... But there's some people today that I know that get themselves into the position where they're thinking that they are sick or there's something wrong with them to carry that into the game to give them that extra boost. Is it a level of is it a level of focus like that? There's there's almost no pressure on yourself because you tell yourself, oh well, it doesn't matter if I play good or not because I'm sick. Mm. Not everyone's a bit uh, shit your pants. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but you're, about fir- you're about to face the first ball, and holy crap, my gut's gone. I've got two hours to get through here before I go to the toilet. Like yeah. first over, you know what I mean? Like it's 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 bizarre. All I think sometimes about Dean Jones, he's 200. He scored that time in India, mm. and I think to myself, as crook as he must have been, it must have been one of the most amazing feelings. Yeah, to yeah. be out there and so doing rewarding. that, and his teammates looking out and going, "Fuck it!" Like I love the fact that AB that he wanted to. He wanted to quit. I can't do it. And he said, oh, "That's right. Just go and we'll get a Queenslander. He could do it." Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah. Uh, your first ever test. Was there a player that you had that, like, did you ever have like a mentor amongst the playing group? Like, I imagine you would have helped younger players. Now, is there any young, like, older players then that helped you out? Yeah. I when I came into the setup, we had Ricky, um, Ricky Ponting, who was there. Uh, you you had guys like, you know, Shane Watson, Mike Hussey, uh, Michael Clark was there. He just took over as captain. Those older guys you looked up to, and that's sort of now what I think about the youngsters coming through. Is there an aura shift? Like when we walked into that dressing room, I was like, "Man, I'm playing with these guys. Like, how cool is this?" And then it was like, I was like, "Wow!" I felt invincible. Like I just felt part of this family and the furniture. That was like, "We're gonna win." I've got these guys on my team, and then that mentality made you clear in your mind, and you could focus and play that you wanted the way that you wanted to. And it's almost like. This team that we have now, we played with each other growing up for so long and we know each other's games so well. And I think that's why the team as a whole has, has had a great sort of period the last sort of 
18 to 24 months because we gelled together. Mm. Now it's about the young guys coming into this setup. Are they the same? Because they're playing Big Bash. You know, they're playing other leagues around the world. They're playing with these guys. Now, is that the same sense that they're getting, the feeling that they're getting? Like, whoa, I'm playing with Steve Smith, what a superstar. Pat Cummins, the Australian Creek captain. You know, like, are they getting that? Like, are yeah. they chuffed to be there? And I don't know that, but I know that's when I was there. I looked up to these guys because I was like, man, I idolized you guys. Yeah. Like, you guys are unbelievable. And I'm sure you would have came in with a couple of players as well that you go, Jesus. I can't believe this. This is where I am. Yeah, yeah. like I'm playing with, yeah. Ken, we'll talk about fear, right? Mm. Candice, interviewing you, like the fear of failure is a big one. Candice, you said to me you had fear of success. Yes. Which is rarer because it it, 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 um, it lifts your expectations around you. But, okay, let, like Dave said that you know, he didn't, he's got a personality that doesn't fear failure. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care. Okay, what about physical fear? I'll ask you first. When Dave was batting against certain bowlers, did you fear for his, like, safety? Ever? Never. No. no. No, not for his safety. Um, I just always wanted David to, still do, just do his best mm. because there was always that level of someone wanting him to fail. So I just, you know, David didn't care so much about what was written about him, but I did. Mm. And I still do because I'm so protective of him. And, um, you know, I've got a little list of all these people who have said some really horrible <laughs> things. And there's been times where I can't bite my tongue and I've sent them a little Twitter message and um, or I've pulled them up on it. Um, so, no, never fearful of his safety, but just um, yeah. fearful and very protective of, of him. Of course, particularly in this day and age. I mean, it's a hypercritical world. Yeah. When I played sport, the worst thing we do is some arsehole would write a letter to the editor. Yeah. So I'm ringing him going, mate, the blokes uh, wrote this about you in the Newcastle Herald. And you go, oh, fuck him. You know. <laughs> yeah. Where these days, it's literally yeah. pilot. It's very funny. I was talking, I was in Vegas, to someone that you both you guys know. And there was something in his life that happened. And a guy wrote, and put his name to it, but wrote, put it in the letterbox. And... His mother took like literally 10 years to see that guy. But when he saw, she saw him, she absolutely fucking unloaded. Yes. Well, that that's kind of like me. And I just, um, <laughs> it's probably not the greatest thing, but I just, it's can't just me. It. I can't it's... help it. And especially when I've got so many facts and numbers that can back up what Dave's done and people, it was just a massive pile on. It was always, because it was easy, you could get a headline. It was great clickbait to to put David's photo or his name or um, sensationalise anything to do with David. And that annoys me. Well, that's what happens these days. Mm. Like literally, you know, with so many websites and the rest of it. Like I had people when me and Joey were bluing, and we still do, you know, you know brothers and all the rest of it. I enjoyed the break, to be honest, for 12 months. <laughs> he probably did too. <laughs> oh, no. No, he was always ringing, trying to break bread. I was like, Jack, actually, is the one who, Jack said to me once he came over and, we and Jack, me and Jack had a bit of a uh, set too, and he goes, get in the fucking car. Get in the fucking car. And I'm like, okay, what's going on? You know, he's twice the size, so I jumped in the car. I was like, what's going on here? And he drove me, as soon as we went across the spit bridge, took me to Joey's place. He said, you fucking blokes make up. And we did, you know what I mean? But people would what ring What an incredible me. son, though, that he cares so much about. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. sure. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but he but it's is. it's not about him, is it? Nah. No. no, but he is. He is an incredible son. Um, but I'd have journos and it was like, you know, for me, it wasn't as serious as it felt for Joey. For me, it was just like, you know, a bit light, but you know, in the clickbait age where, you know, stories are about how many hits on them, they were saying, just give us one more thing on Joey. Mm. Can we just give us, and I, cause I thought and you awesome. would, and you I always would, <laughs> I would. <laughs> yeah. and I just go, oh, okay, what about that? And little did I know that over the other bunker, Joey's here going, I'm going to fucking kill this bloke. <laughs> okay, hey, wait, hey, hang on one sec. Before we get off this topic, I want to ask you, were there any bowlers that you like did not like facing? Um, look, I, I said it recently. Dale Stain was one guy that I just knew. As soon as you saw these eyes spin, it was like, man, this guy's got another gear. Yeah. And I was... You know, I was thankful that he was trying to just swing the ball in his first spell, but his second spell, it was almost like they identified who they wanted to ramp it up against. Mm. And I was fortunate enough not to sort of be one of those guys, but 
in Perth, it was a it was about a half an hour period. Me and Sean Marsh were batting, and he came in. He actually broke his shoulder that game. Um, came in, literally tried to rip our heads off, like every ball. And that's probably the, the at that time was probably the most fearful I've ever been, because I I walked down to Sean. I actually Sean Marsh walked to me in one of the best pull shot players in the game coming from Perth, and he goes, I can't pull him. What are we gonna do? Mm. <laughs> I said, man, I got no idea. If you can't pull him, how am I gonna pull him? So, you know, he put me on my ass, put Sean on his ass, and that stage then I was like, I'm just gonna try and get through his spell, and from there I'm gonna try and gain some form of respect and not engage with him in that on the field and. Thankfully, he broke his shoulder, and I yeah. didn't have the rest was history. I didn't have to play. Well, it's funny, Dave. Looking back, like I'm a I'm a like kid lived through the seventies and eighties. The eighties for me in cricket was like, and I went I, I lived through the West Indies, the dynasty, and we oftentimes look back um, rose coloured glasses and romanticise. But like, okay, how would have you gone against Garner, Holding, Marshall, Roberts? Croft and those have you have you thought about that how what that would be like I mean do, are those guys how do they stack up against the best bowlers today I think the first probably three or four years of my career probably would have had had me mm. I think as you get older and test cricket and everyone's getting braver you can start playing all these different shots mm. so I would be trying to break sort of their rhythm by doing that and I think that's the only way you'd be able to do it because by watching the old footage the guys were just standing there and just literally getting their Splices knocked over, their fingers, you know, smashed, yeah. and they were incredible. And I faced probably three bowlers in my career that are almost seven foot, and they weren't as fast or line and length, and it wasn't Test match cricket. But I can, the steep bounce for a short guy, I can imagine yeah. how would, hard it would have been. Would you loved it, Dave, for you? Because you, yeah, as I said, you're a street fighter. Would oh, you, well, would I would have. You loved to face, the, face those blokes. I would have because I think, as I said, the games evolved. So if I go back then, I probably would have played the same way that the guys would have. Um, because the innovation hadn't come yet, but today you have to you have to move around the crease. You have to you have to do something to put the bowler off his line of length. And if they're trying to hit me in the throat, I'm I'm moving around and trying to play some different shots and mm. get them off their mark. And it's all about losing the people behind you in the slips. If you can lose them, they can't pitch it up and they can't nick you off. Yep. So that's the key. All right, let's, we've spoken about fear of fate. Like let's talk about success. Candice, you and Dave, your relationship. Does it operate best in? I'm not going to say failure. Oh, that's say when yeah. I'm not here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything now, at home runs smoothly. Yeah. But at times, yeah. when Dave, you know, in tough times, or when Dave's flying, it doesn't change. You're it right. doesn't change for us. Um, but I know that sort of if he is going through a lean trot, that it's only you. Only you know your next innings one big score is just around the corner. So for me, it was always about being working as a team. And, you know, if David succeeded or had a really great innings, then I felt like as a family and as a couple, we've succeeded because I don't believe once you have a family that you can achieve and get to those great heights without being a team. Mm. Um, So I was always really just very supportive. I was really happy to just take a back seat, but do whatever it was possible to to get David to achieve it and get those, you know, big scores, achieve his goals, whether it be introduce him to, you know, a mind coach, do this, do that. Through my sport, I was able to open his eyes to certain things and that gave me a lot of pleasure. What about, um, like, me playing? There was a point in my, where me and Trish, Trish is like, you know, tan girl from Newcastle, from Cessna, um, I remember once saying to Trish, hmm, I'm thinking about buying a BMW. And she goes, you fucking wanker. If you do it, yeah. has there been anything <laughs> yeah. ever in Dave's that you've gone, Jeez, hey, how, listen. Long, how long have you got? <laughs> <laughs> Just pull your fucking head in, Dave. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I'm pretty conservative, and but David definitely is the spender. And But I've, you know, in the past... 17 hours of the first race at Rambo. <laughs> Uh, my, my alarm's set. <laughs> Racing and, retros and, on at nine. An allowance. And Tony Brussel. Yeah. <laughs> what do you reckon, Gator? Yeah. So David's got an allowance. It's a healthy allowance. So yeah. don't think that I've grown him by the balls and he can't enjoy mm. his life. Yeah. Um, but I've had a decline once. Really? Yeah, yeah I had it once. Because and I, da- said, I, I said, have I been paid? 
Yeah. <laughs> because <laughs> yes. the big fella over there, like he's talking about having someone by the balls. Mum's got him so tight. Hey, he hey, has, hey, hey. He's got a card, mm. but he has no idea how much is on it or he has no access to his bank account. That's David. Has I, zero idea. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't David even, doesn't I even have, have the app, the phone banking app have on an his app. phone. No. I'll <laughs> say that. I've got no, people say, uh, yeah, you get with arsehole sometimes and they go oh, how much money I said I've got no idea mm. if I ever win on the pokies I just hide it yeah. I've got pockets up there in my room like <laughs> yeah. please don't tell yeah. Yeah. don't tell Mussolini yeah. but I got it I just I just hide it away yeah I buried some in the backyard once in the old house and I forgot where it was because I was so blind <laughs> <laughs> eventually I'm I found not it that bad that David has to bury <laughs> but well. they're, they're Benjamin so they're, they're, I need to keep them above ground <laughs> <laughs> Um, yeah, he likes to spend, and but I just make sure that everything, you know, the mortgages pay, the the bills, as long as he can use his card. Then but that's, that's where the worst thing is. If I'm trying to surprise Candice or buy a present, I can't. Because then oh, she'll yeah. see the transaction come up on the thing. Oh, mate. Westpac will go, ding. Oh, what's this purchase? $585. Oh, flowers. You're such a great husband. <laughs> These are good flowers. Yeah, Dave, this, this is your beer. I tell what I'm going to do. I'm going to go get another one. You yeah, cheers. Yeah, yeah thanks. Yeah, to? I'll have another one as well. Actually, you know, just grab two because I don't think you'll be able to hold three. Are you going to keep rolling on? Yeah, keep rolling. Okay, we'll just keep rolling on. I don't know you've got height issues, so I'll help you out a couple of things. No, no, it's all right, mate. No, I'll just slip out. He's done it sounding boards as well. you got the absorption. Oh, mate, we soundproof it all in here. It's really professional in here. It's the only thing we do that's professional. Yeah. We do. You, you could actually put us in Vegas with the green screen. Are you sure you're right? Yeah, we could. We actually should Sitting do at the that. Ta- put a Baccarat table yeah, or something in front of us here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're talking about Vegas stories before you guys come in. While Matthew's just taking a quick break, you've been to Vegas a couple of times, haven't you? I have. Yeah. Yep. Early doors. Early doors. Have you been as well, Candice? Yes, once before. Okay. Never together? Never together. Yeah, okay. Because I took my missus came over with me just gone and obviously dad had Trish with him as well. So I haven't had that experience of doing it on my own. I mean, it was fun nonetheless, but what were some of the best things that you did over there? Uh, or worst? No, wor- uh, I didn't really have a, a bad experience. My my experience... That's not what you told me. My experience was I went on the... Um, is it the New York, New York roller coaster? Yes. By myself at, I think it was 11 o'clock in the morning, hungover because I wanted to get away from everyone because I had had enough at that stage. Went and watched Circus Soir or Circus Soleil, whatever it yeah, is. Yeah, Circus Soleil. I went and watched that. Um, that was an experience. Um, yet again, that was a hungover kind That's of That's on your own experience. as well. That was on my own. Um, and then um, I told you before, I, I rocked up uh, at about 2, 3 a.m. in the morning and found the um, ambulance and five people in my room because I made, I made it went a little bit too hard and uh, had to be taken to the hospital for a couple of days. <laughs> yeah, but wasn't there a story that your whole room got flooded? Well, we can tell that how, one. How does a room get flooded? Are you on like so, the 20s? Wouldn't you be up Yeah, high? so hang on. We, we can't air that because then they might actually – I never saw a bill for that. Oh, so, they, I mean, they won't chase you up now. No. No, so like... They're probably not listening it was to the no. backstage as it was, well. It was the absolute vodka suite, which was on the, I think, the hangover or whatever it was. And downstairs had this dance floor and a bed that looked like it was in a pool. Yeah. And we'd rocked up at about... Well, I woke up at about four in the morning. My mate woke me up and said, mate, he goes, the room's flooded. And I'm like... What do you mean, mate, the room's flooded? He goes, it's flooded. There is shit and toilet paper all over the entire bottom floor. The dance floor is covered in shit. It's uh, this high of water. And it literally, that bed was like it was in a pool. Oh. And so we were checking out. So we went downstairs, checked out 6 a.m. The lady goes, you don't have to check out till 11 o'clock. I said, it's best that we leave now. <laughs> and the water was trickling outside the door and almost down the elevators. Oh. And that's when I had to go. To, I was going to New York, and I got that phone call to go to the Australian A. And I said to my manager, "I am not going. <laughs> I'm having the best time of my life, mate. The best time." And luckily, I didn't end up going to the uh, the Australian A tour because is that Vegas? The rest was history. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what an awful place. <laughs> but yeah. we're talking about how you just like the next day, you just get back. You know, you can have a, have another drink. Yeah, well, I that's admit- back in the day. Like we drink responsibly. Now. Yeah. Of course, of course. Now, um, yeah. I want to. Well, just done two trips in a row. The first one with Fletch, Hindy, and Gordy. And uh, me and Fletch presented ourselves so bad back to our wives that Trish and Britt said, okay, we're um, we're coming over this trip, but we have one day up there. So they had an, an extra day in LA and we had one. I said, let's go. And uh, it was it was pretty big. Uh, Cooper actually 
I I got lost. Cooper found me. Uh, yeah, we lost on on the one strip. Yeah, yeah, I did. Yes, yeah. you I couldn't did. remember. You couldn't remember one of the four hundred hotels yeah. that you were staying. Literally, at. it's north and south, and he managed to just veer <laughs> east and west. I don't know. He ended up in Area Fifty One trying to tackle an alien, but I ended up going into reception and uh, <laughs> an I ended up in reception and like was like, hey, my, I felt like a fifteen year old kid in Woolies. I was like, hey, I'm my dad's lost. <laughs> <laughs> we had to do an interview at ten together, and I was like, my dad's lost. Like, can you find him? And they were like, oh. Do you know his room number? I was like, no, I don't know his room number. And she, the little lady was like, oh, okay, rang up. And it was like 10 a.m. at this stage. And dad, you could just hear his disgusting voice on the other end. This nice lady, <laughs> she nearly got drunk through the phone. And he was like, hello? And she's like, oh, I've got your son down here in reception. <laughs> Bring him up. That would have been epic if you're doing those laps around like the hangover in the fountain. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's a, uh, and of course, you've just seen Trish up the top. We went to Timmy Trumpet. We went to Thunder from Down Under. The, like all those young ladies who played the male strip troop, they're just yeah. champion blokes. And then we went to Timmy Trumpet, and it was like it was the Jerry Kraus. It yeah. was so good. And it Trish was, was having a big night, and then stumbled down the stairs and broke her ankle. Yeah. Did you just leave her there? No, I took her home. We left her in Vegas. We, we left her in yeah, Vegas, yeah. Though. Yeah. but we yeah. Well, yeah. we carried her home that night. Yeah, we, car- we did the right thing, and uh, but then we had to go back. It's funny because the two games were taking place and Trish was like, oh, I don't think I can go to the games. Mate, the ankle was fucking huge. And I was like, mate, she's definitely broke it. And uh, she goes, I can't go to the games. When Fletcher's, uh, Fletcher's wife, Britt, she got a motor scooter. So Trish is like going to the game. And I'm as we're about to do the broadcast and um, – Yvonne Sampson goes, well, here we are, we're in Vegas, and tonight, you know, blah, blah. And I look over, and there's Trish behind the post with Fletcher's wife just on the schooners. And I'm thinking to myself, fuck me, Dad, that ankle. No. That ankle <laughs> tomorrow. Yeah. 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 She could have been in Circus LA. She had, like, the elephant ankle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was dreadful. Uh, jumping off Vegas, paparazzi. Do you mm. guys, like, in Australia mainly, do you guys get hit with paparazzi much? A little bit. 2018 was actually um, quite confronting. Different kinds of paps that you've never seen before. They actually got me um, taking out the garbage for the first time in my life oh, with a shirt like off that? and I was on the front page. I, I remember that. I couldn't believe it. I was like, of all times, I'm taking out the rubbish. There's a the guy there taking a photo of me. The time he took the rubbish out ever <laughs> and he gets papped. That's good. Yeah. At least that's a good look. Well, like, it's just doing the, doing the house. That's house, something. They should have got you doing the dishwasher as well. Yeah. <laughs> look, yeah, I think that was pr- that was a really bad time with the that was hectic because they were pretty. They were trying to aggravate David mm. and myself to get some sort of response. Generally, you sort of they're local ones that you you get to know. They, and they did from your brother. Yeah, well, Timmy, <laughs> Timmy, her brother, the oldest brother. Um, he had enough. He and went and got a shovel and smacked it, it across one of the pap's windscreen. It was 6.30 in the morning. We're down having coffee at our um, local. And um, this guy was just taking his photos. And, um, yeah, Timmy was losing it because his kids were there. And he, you know, he's not that type of guy that he just thinks someone's evading our privacy. So he actually ran after him and mm. tried to but cover his head, lot, but yeah. um, it didn't work. But, I mean, it gets a lot for the family, you know, and we yeah. can deal with it, but not everyone else can because they're not used to it. But... Most of the time now, they're they're pretty friendly. They're nice, yeah. um, but back then they were vultures. Well, we did. Yeah. I was gonna say it was before. If it was before Candace, so I'll, I'll be thinking, going, have I done something wrong here? Yeah. What have I done? Yeah. But now it's just like it's like okay, what photo do you want? Like, is it? I don't know. Is it yeah. just us walking down the beach or something? Like, and then mm. push on. But Dave, yeah. like, without embarrassing Cooper, like you know, Cooper went from being a fringe <laughs> first grader to and retiring to going on the Colin Jackie show. Mm. And for him, it's like, okay, I'm on the Colin Jackie O show. But the nature of that behemoth of a show, everything's changed. And it shocked me to the point that people are going, oh, you know, oh have a look at this. And there's people, Coop's getting papped. <laughs> Cooper John's <laughs> arrives back in Sydney from Vegas. I saw that. And I'm I thinking to myself, hey, standards. guys, there's a lot of wars going on. It must be a very <laughs> fucking slow news day. Yeah. But it did, like, it's... Like Nathan Cleary was here. We interviewed Nathan, right? That came out you know, a week or two ago. And I said to Nathan, like that 17 minutes in the grand final, how much has that changed your life? And he, he went, oh, you go, like, because Nathan went from being on the back pages to the front pages. Yeah. 
and he said, yeah, paparazzi was just sitting outside mum and dad's house. You know, my my sister would go out and they'd papa, and he said it was, you know, getting filmed with you know, Mary, long angle, long angle lens. And I suppose, you know, for people out of the blue, that is just yeah, very, very confronting. It is, especially if it's where we're at school pickup and there's photographers oh. around. Like, I actually get really embarrassed because it just draws more attention to us. And, yeah, I find that a little bit too much a bit embarrassing and, and, a, and a bit much and generally because we're from Aruba a lot of the people just start abusing them and stuff like that yeah. as they should I mean you don't photograph around a, a school zone and stuff like yeah. that but Do you remember the day boys remember the day that bloke and like we were doing nothing at the time well I, I was nothing special going in my career and we used to do what we used to call a uh, we, we call a Greg English drill we used to kick across the road and the boys would compete for the high ball and this dude like, there was a car just sitting there. And I thought, anyway, he bobbed his head up, this bloke, weird-looking cat, right? And then he drove off, and I thought, that's weird. Then he came around again. Next minute, this long angle lens came out. And he's, like, photographing me and the boys. And I'm like, fuck, right. So I chased him, right, and grabbed him by the arm. And he's running down the road, and I'm yelling out, pedophile, pedophile. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes, that's what you've got to do. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. I, I called the fuzz. And we were going, which one? Which one? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and I ran the fuzz and they came around. They said, you know, and they, they said, we know the guy. Yeah. And went over and said, hey, listen. But, like, there was no rhyme or reason why he would be. But, yeah, I can imagine for you guys. Yeah. Your school pickup, you go. Things like yeah. that. It's you a bit you get to know which ones they are. And if they're not them, that's when you go, who are these people? Yeah, because we had a, we had a couple recently, never seen them before. A lady was literally sitting out the front in this little Toyota Yaris, mm. never seen them before, and she's just taking these photos like snap, snap with like a normal, a normal is it a sponsor <laughs> camera? Um, mm. uh, we'll, beat, <laughs> we'll beat that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, with it, this is a basic camera, mm. and we're like, what is going on here? Who is this person? So we had to ask around who these people were, but they're the local. It's the paper. So we're used to the, the the normal people who take the paps where it might, might be a celebrity or an agency or, an agency yeah. or someone. This was actually just an everyday news paper. And I still can't even remember what it was for. Yeah. But there was another one that got us at the beach. Same thing what you're saying. It was camouflage in a bush with a long lens. And I was put this guy go, what is going on here? Is there something <laughs> that we don't know that's happening around in the world? And that's where I get scared because I'm like, shit, if someone's taking a photo... We don't know happened. them. What's brewing? What's happened? Yeah, yeah what's, what's brewing? brewing? Yeah. What's brewing? What's happened? What's that that we don't know about? And mm. then you start to get a bit anxious, like, okay, what? It's not as bad as obviously the Americans. They're chasing people, going through red lights, and mm. like that's just that's a different level over there. Yeah. It's crazy. Mm. Yeah. Hey, uh, just for a sec. Well, before we get off cricket, uh, best sledges that you've ever copped on the field? Because I'd imagine I know you're not a guy to really react because you don't really like. You know, oh, it really? doesn't really. Well, oh, sorry. I mean, you don't feel the pressure. I don't know whether you are someone who reacts to sledges or not. But what's some of the ones that? Not there's not really many. Like, I kept on getting called rent a quote. It's <laughs> 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 like because I used to just nail and dribble, right? I used to just dribble everything. So I kept on getting called rent a quote, and I'm sitting there going, "What the hell is rent a quote?" And I'm like, Jesus, I need to call all this crap. And then there was one time in under nineteens. Uzi, Uzi's laughing his head off. This guy kept on calling me Carney. And I come off the field and I said, Uzi, mate, this guy's calling me Carney. Like, why, why is he calling me Carney? And I spelled it with a K. And he goes, no, he's calling you a Carney folk, mate. Like, what the <laughs> <circus>? <laughs> like, that prick, oh, when he comes out, I'm going to get him. I, call, I was like, I was playing, I just looked like the biggest idiot. I was like, Jesus. And it's always stuck. Mate, when always I, stuck. When we played a Wigan, me and my great mate, Brian Carney, and Br uh, like, you know, my heritage is Irish and Brian is uh, an Irishman. And we, we both got small hands. We both look the same. And we're playing St. Helens' estate. And we keep going. If we scored a try, we'd go back. And this one bloke standing behind goes, Car Carnies, Carnies, little hands, smell like cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Dave, the best innings you ever played. Best innings. Oh, um, We can take out the Ashes of 2019. Um, there's none there. I think the 300, um, I think, you know, it's the longest I've ever batted. Nine hours, uh, day-night test match. Um, that's probably probably the best. And and coming back from 2018, um, mm. written off, you know, would he ever play again? 
um, his thought process, all this kind of crap. So I think that would probably be my best my best test innings to date. Um, scored a hundred in a session. That was quite special. Didn't know how special that was because I didn't know it hadn't been really done before. Um, and then I think the two hundred. You talked about pressure. I didn't feel any of the pressure, but just the relief for my family. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, that was that was more for me. When you talk about pressure, it's more relief for my family. Um, they're three that definitely stick out. In, in my mind because one's hard to pick I'll ask both of you guys this do you have a favourite pitch for you Dave is there a pitch where every time you played there you felt you played a really strong game and to you Candice mm. is there a pitch that you just loved going to to watch a place yeah maybe a feel like because wet coop I d- like I don't want to like inform you of this but the fans don't sit on the pitch okay? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying yes yeah, so, okay it's a synonym ground yeah. as opposed to pitch yeah that would really? actually be interesting how what I, I love so I know from the viewing area I I want to know your answer before I give from a viewing area from point a, of view. from a viewing area this was probably the worst but from mind a, you sitting in a box with wine and everything which Candace never ever t- <laughs> took never touched <laughs> never yeah mind you um I loved going to Gaul in Sri Lanka oh yeah right down near the old Gaul yeah. fort um it was pretty spectacular it was very small ground um people would get sit up on the old fort um. Yeah, it's just you get a took to, to the ground. Yeah. It's it's awesome. It's, it's just it's a park. the ocean yeah. right there. Old Portuguese colony in the yeah. Gulf. Yeah, um, yes. So that was pretty special. That it's was a one park. Of my that's the best thing about it. Cricket, you play in a park. Yeah, Isn't and that, that's yeah. unique about it. Isn't that bizarre that we have these enormous stadiums, MCG, SCG, and, and so on and so forth? Yeah, and then you go to the West Indies. Yeah, and you're playing those that are parks. Yeah, yeah. and literally cool. in Gaul, we had a plastic seat on the other side of the picket fence. But it was just to watch it and just to see. It's just spectacular. Mm. It's good. Best, like your favourite pitch. Oh, me, Wacker. Nothing was ever getting me out there. They're yeah, right. Okay. It just literally, was a, it, was, it was a road, but it was fast. Mm. Fast, bouncy. You could leave ball in length, not that it left many. Um, and the Gabba, they're two, they were usually the first two tests um, of the summer. And you just knew, I'm in for a good summer if so I score you, well there. You'd rather speed than spin? Yeah, spin was more um, later on in the career. The wicket started getting more challenging, especially when you're going to India and Sri Lanka. Yeah. Um, scored a very good hundred, um, back-to-back hundreds in um, Bangladesh, and it was the same thing. And you try, as I was saying before, you can't emulate that. You can't go back into that mindset of how did I score that? How did I get through that? But couldn't get through it um, in in India, for example. Yeah. But yeah, you you just you you know sometimes that you're going all right. I'm playing here, and that's yeah. probably why in Perth when I was there it's at the Optus Stadium, not not the Wacker, I just had this sense of feeling that I know what my week leading in is going to be like. Yeah. So you you, you same routine pretty much, a couple of rounds of golf, a few G and T's, and Way play some go. cricket. What about like teammates? Your all time favorite teammate? All time? Yeah. <clears throat> um. Oh, me and Uzi are very close. Yep. Um, we've been close for a long, long time. Young kids growing up. Um, you played juniors together? Yeah, we did, yeah. Um, two complete different cultures. Um, chalk and cheese. Um, very smart. Not so smart. Um, <laughs> so he didn't do good at the HSC, but, Uzi? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had to try and ask the guy, how do you spell my name again? <laughs> um, but yeah, like we just got on like a house on fly. Our brothers played cricket together at the same age and we just excelled in everything we did he played out west towards the back end of his career then moved to um queensland for an opportunity me him and phil hughes at the same time were actually all looking to move at the same time just due to coaching capabilities at the time we weren't getting enough we weren't we didn't think we were learning enough so they both went and i was like well why do why why am i leaving i might as well just stay um but him hughesy um, and probably Steve Smith, where we're all good mates. We all came along the same sort of um, age groups. And, yeah, we've all got along really, really well. Um, I, I, yeah. I'd never met Phil. What, what sort of guy was, was Phil? Oh. Mate, you'd be sitting here across the bar and he'll throw ice cubes at you. Mm. Until, you until you got up and mate said, mate, enough is enough, mate. <laughs> Another one. But <laughs> yeah. he was a ripper, absolute ripper. He would be, he just loved his cows. Loved his farm, loved his family, loved his cows. And it was, every time he came, it was, as soon as he was there in your presence, you just had a smile on your face. How big of an impact did that have on you two guys? Oh, ma- massive for, for me. I was I was out there at the time. I was feeling a backward point. Um, and that whole sort of five minutes, 
that whole sort of scenario there was just phew, it all happened so fast and didn't know what we just didn't know what to do um had absolutely no idea and it's um mm. it's still in, in this day it's in the back of your mind all the time and like that next week was tough and then leading into adelaide um you, you, you just thoughts are always with the family the whole time um you know of, of what could have what could have been with with Huey and we always talk about he's always up the other end with us mm. um but special talent absolute special talent opponents dave you're a great competitor an opponent that you played against like i don't mean like a great competitor but someone that you just a great guy that you loved um i get really along really really well with um kane williamson um again complete polar opposites um in the way we are as people um i feel like you're the opposite to so many people I, yeah <laughs> we, i get that i get that a lot um, but like you know really you know he's a gentleman he's really you know yeah i like a softly guy spoken. softly spoken um but an uh, awesome bloke and um a lot of my success in ipls because he's been in the team that i was with at the time um but from um people that i haven't played with in teams i think I started to get along with like Brody and Jimmy Anderson um, at the back end of my career. Yeah. Um, as you get older, it's a bit different, you know. And I think because we hadn't played in the same teams, you still had that bit of like distance. Like yeah. I don't know him. I go out there and just you know give it my best. But you know when they got the upper edge on you, sort of got to try and be on the nice yeah. side. <laughs> yeah, those Northern Englishmen are the best people in the world. They're awesome. You don't want to get in a... Oh, yeah. I know you've been in a few drinking uh, battles with a few people <laughs> yes. in your time, but they do. those guys, my goodness. What are best drinkers you've ever drank with while we're on that? Gee. Um, Is there someone who can just put them away? Yeah, Josh Hazelwood. Really? Oh, yeah. yeah. Secret From the bag. country. Oh, oh that <laughs> doesn't change. It does not change. Yeah. Just does yeah. not change at all. Um, wow. And then there's a couple that just, if they have two, it's good oh, night. Yeah, yeah liability night. stuff. Well, yeah. liabilities, yeah. yeah. Shout out to Steve, Steve Smith. <laughs> <laughs> nah, Steve, definitely, don't, Steve yeah. definitely not. Um, move away cricket for a second. Now, you guys. Candice? Yes. South Sydney. Yes. Rabbitohs. Staunch. Dave. Proper supporter too, member. Proper, yeah. yeah. Paying member. Uh, whole, whole life? Whole life. Okay. Yeah. Like family, Working everyone? Working family. Yes. Yeah. Hang on, pay, paying member. You get a, you get it given to you by your brother for his birthday. <laughs> by your birthday somewhere. every year. But you get he it. would yeah. pay for it. Yeah. 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 Okay, and then pay double. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Dave, which is the only thing elitist in his life, roosters. Oh, it makes me sick. Don't yep. ask me any stats. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been a roosters your whole life? Whole life. Okay. Yeah. E okay, wow. Yeah. All right, that so surprises me. Let's go back two years. In my opinion, I grew up like falling in love with the rugby league in the 70s when Dad played in the coalfields in Newcastle, which was almost catch and kill. One of the greatest games I've seen, Allianz Stadium, that semi-final, mm -hmm. Roosters versus Bunny. Bunnies, what is happening in your house? We well, were, we're there. there. Were there. With our girls. Um, and one's a rooster, one's a rabbit. Oh, oh, nice. chaos. So we lost a child because she wanted to try and get into the, the rooster's change rooms and giving them dressing down. So she, we didn't know where she was. She, we, we lost, she we're was downstairs, trying to get it? into the change So the roosters have the chairman's lounge, you know that part down there? Yeah. Um, so we, we were down there and we lost her. We're like, where's Indy? And she's over near the change room wanting to give a pep talk to a couple of guys. I said, Indy, get over here. She goes, no, nah, I need to speak to him. Yeah. I was like, Candice, that's you. Go get your child. No, um, but yeah, so that was obviously unbelievable. That was the first time I had been to that stadium. And I think the Roosters won the game. The, the, they yeah, won the, the week, week before. before yeah. So they were a bit cocky. Um, but I think... Hang on, we, got, we, lost, we lost to Desco. So that was a massive play yeah. in the game. Yeah. Massive play. And we're all sitting there because ear to the ground trying to work out, you know, what's going on, you know, with him. And he apparently, I don't know, he was showing signs of nausea and, and, and yeah. that. So he couldn't actually get back out there. That was insane. But and straight was... away, we're all like, okay, that's going to be tough work. But I was sitting work. next to this one old lady from the Roosters that would yes. not shut God, up. God, I hate old, God, I hate old people. Big, oh, you. they are just she miserable. She was so loud and she just wouldn't shut up. I was this close to saying, listen. So you Wrap all it up. It's time to go. Like yeah. your team's losing. It's time to go. But that was a spectacular game. Like oh, incredible. it was brutal. From it the was... start when Victor, yep. when they got yeah. the end, all the sin bins. And... Yep. But do you reckon that was out of control though? Like sin bins for... Dave, it's like... It was okay. ridiculous. When you go to a rock concert, 
What makes a rock concert is a sense of menace. Mm. That's what you're there for. And for me, I, it's been a long time since I've seen a game and there's been a sense of menace and unpredictability. And the thing I love, the fact it brought that tribalism in, where people are over the fence and they're screaming. Like, it was, for me, yeah. people are going, oh, that game was a disgrace. That game can't have it for yeah. 26 weeks. But for that one off, yeah. it's one of the it's one of the things that sticks in my mind. I just thought it was insanely it's like watching A grade the clubs yeah, and, like. and yes. the hatred yeah, fully. that those two clubs have. Like being there on that day, it was just it was something special. But to hear the crowd and everyone hearing those knocks, everyone's like, let, let them roll. But it's like the Origin. Now I don't want to put you on the spot here, but mm. you allow everyone they allow everyone to, to to that to roll along. Right, no stoppages, no nothing. But then you come to a club game and everyone's watching. Hang back. on, we've got to do the right thing. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, it's, it's, like, it's, yeah. it's hard to watch as a spectator. I know it's not my yeah. game, but I'm like going, you know, let him go. It? I reckon there should be they should bring a rule in where it's a two minute bin for th for games like that where it's big. Like an and ice you hockey. You don't want five blokes in the sin bin for ten minutes because yeah, ten minutes a is long. a long time yeah. and it sort of damages the quality of the game, especially the time of the game. It's a big part of the game. Ten minutes is huge. But oh, that yeah. was almost. <clears throat> excitement is the countdown of when the player was going to come back on as well yeah. and just sort of be a <laughs> one one came, one so, out. Yeah. That's a it's a great stadium yeah. is oh, it that's fantastic that's incredible do you guys have favorite players of all time of all time i do um Andrew Johns, your brother. I appreciate that. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Andrew. Yeah, I just remember at 96, that grand final, we were up at Coolangatta, um, the September holidays, and it was just one of those grand finals that was against Manly, hated Manly, hated Tuvi. I don't know why, um, <laughs> but it was just one of those grand finals. It was just so spectacular, and Darren Albert scored at the end. Mm. Wow. Yeah. It was, do you know, like... Seriously, I, I said to the boys, there's things in... I'm going to big note myself here. I don't mean to, but I, I thought this today. So go ahead. There's a couple of things that sticks out in my life in football. One is winning the 97 grand final. Yeah, sorry, 97. It's all right. I wouldn't want to correct yeah. you. Yeah. Hey, mate, so <laughs> you I ran through it anyway. I've gone yeah. around the cable yeah. good hope yes, to yes, correct. Sorry. Playing Origin for the first time, even though I did win a game in all four, yeah. <laughs> even though I had blinders. Of course. <laughs> Playing for Australia at Wembley Stadium. And Las Vegas. Wow. As a fan and a rugby league person, to go to Las Vegas and see what happened there and just the fans and everything, that was... Do you think they could go to three games and do maybe like the, the World Club Challenge or Candace, something? Candice, I think what they'll do uh, next year is on the first day, they'll have NRLW game, World Club Challenge, and the next day, the four sides that'll play. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny with the Roosters. When the Roosters won straight after, Nick Politis said, well, we've got to go over again because what it should be is the winners keep playing. Yeah. I thought yeah. Nick wouldn't have said that if the they Roosters also, got I think only won two, games in, two opening round games in the last seven years. So for them to get a win... It was, was massive. Yeah. Is that a superstition then? They're going to have to go back? Maybe. Yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> Geez, Victor, was, who's your favourite player, Dave? Yeah, look, I... Look, I think... I think Joey's one of those guys that I, I look at the way that he could change a game. And I think if you take that person out of a team to have that big of an impact and the only person, the other person I can think of is, is JT, mm. you know, and I think they're, they're guys that are, are, are quite special in, in and around the, the team. And I think that's why I think they're great. And I think that's why they are where they are. A lot of similarities between you and Joey in the fact that I envied that Joey didn't care. Yeah. I didn't know whether it was a discipline or just part of his makeup and learnt it was just part of his makeup. That ability to not care is a special gift. Yeah. Mm. It's funny you say that because even we see that with our kids now. Our eldest um, is very competitive and tries to be the perfectionist and do everything. And our middle child just has all the natural ability and just doesn't care <laughs> and but gets results. You know, like doesn't do any swimming training, makes New South Wales team, or doesn't care about Oztag, makes the state team. You know, it's mm. just unbelievable. It's a good quality to have. Playing without, we used to call it playing without a conscience. Mm. Like being able to drop it a hundred times, which like, you know, me and dad it's did a fair time, and then hey, hey, not hey. care. Please. Do not put me in your bracket. Right. Okay, you, please. But it's <laughs> frustrating. <You're my> <laughs> it's so frustrating yeah. because I think, just care like but she doesn't care yeah. if she wins or loses couldn't care less yeah yeah it's funny when the girls came in i said to the girls only because i come from family of three yeah 
and I said, the oldest one, I said, you're the responsible one, mm. the middle one, I said, uh, you're the wild one, and the young one, you're the cheeky one. They went, yes, because that's, that's just the that's makeup exactly. of yeah. every family. Exactly. That's how it is. <clears throat> exactly. Yep. So the girls, there's one rooster, one rabbit. Does the other one support anyone? Uh, <laughs> she's a rooster when I'm home, a rabbit <laughs> when I'm not home, and her other team is the up, sharks. up, Cronulla. Oh, Love really? Sharks. Really? And she can sing the whole Do you remember song. that Love kid, Keenan Cahill? Does it up, 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 yeah, up, oh, up, yeah. Up. yeah. 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 No, she has it on yeah. repeat at home all the time. Yeah, on YouTube. Yeah, I don't know why she loves Because the daycare teacher um, goes right. for Cronulla. But so yeah, when Dad's teams. home, they all <clears throat> just want to impress Dad. Yeah, did you have okay. a team that obviously played for, for Newcastle, but did you have a team that you actually went for as a kid besides I did, you went Dave. Newcastle? I always believe that you pick a team built on your own personality. And for me, I loved the Balmain Tigers growing up. Because for me, I always saw myself, rightly or wrongly, as a sort of battler and an underdog. And for Balmain, it was always, they were always the side that was mid table, the, the, the engine that maybe could. And for me, every year to hope that they make the finals and how far they could go. My favourite year in all the history of rugby league as a fan was 1988. Because the Tigers were sitting sort of mid table, not doing anything. And an Englishman came across called Ellery Hanley and was insane and i El, i loved ellery so much when he came across that i named my uh dog ellery i was gonna name uh, jack ellery but unfortunately he turned up yeah. being a boy when he's born <laughs> <laughs> what, <But> he, <laughs> why do you think englishmen have had such success when they've come out here because you think of adrian morley you think of yeah. sam burgess even they're they're almost a different breed they're hand-picked they, yeah, they, 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 you're, you're right. You're picking though. the best. Yeah. Pretty much picking the best. They're picking yeah. the best, but they're unorthodox. There's something different. And those northern blokes, they always said, particularly the forwards, there was an old saying that, I mean, those old, th those northern guys are really tough guys. Back in the day, they used to say, if you needed a front row, I'd just yell down a mine shaft and one would come up. And the way they play, we're coming out of it now in, in Australia, but for, for a long time, we were so structured and the Englishmen were just unorthodox. So that's why they've mm. had success. I uh, spoke about Sam Burgess. You were on SAS with Sam. I was talking to Missile actually about you the so other day. I was day. on with Missile. You're on with Missile. Yes. Sorry. Okay. What was your impressions of the Missile? And what was that experience like on SAS? Um, I loved it. Yeah. Um, because I just. Beat Mitchell Johnson. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> Was he on it? Well, it wasn't hard to beat him. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Um, yeah, click, so, click, 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 click. Yeah. <laughs> but it's, um, he was really quiet. And I think... Wow. Uh, I think because of he was so sort of introverted, I think that was one of the reasons why he didn't get through. He obviously made it to the end. And you think if you've made it to the end, you obviously have a pretty special quality. But I think because of him being so to himself maybe that was why he didn't get selected or whatever but I loved it I loved the physicality of it um, working as a team um, just doing being completely out of my comfort zone and anything that's sort of a physical challenge mm. I'll always put my hand up and say I'll give it a crack if she's competing She's competing. Yeah, I'm oh, competing. How do you two go together? Like, do you guys compete uh, heavily in board games and things like that? Well, not in housework. Cause yeah, Candice will always win. Well, you don't do any. It's not hard. <laughs> yeah. I'll just put the hand up. I'm done. No, well, it does get competitive. Um, during COVID, actually, we, we weren't competitive, but we we set ourselves a goal of running 10 k's, and I would never have thought myself I could run 10 k's, but with Candice pushing pushing me. I was always trying to chase her. And then we're starting yeah. to get and 16 Ks, 20 Ks. And then because Candice ran a marathon during the, I was practicing for the Gold Coast Marathon during an Ashes series. So she's out in the Hyde Park doing 35 Ks. Oh, yeah. that's I was just like, what are you doing? You're I remember, mad. I remember interviewing Candice and you were saying, like, you had that addictive personality where you start to, oh, well, I'm sorry. No, you said you're competitive and you said you started to run and you, you just did it for fun. And I asked you, I said, okay. Given your natural personality, how long though was it before you were going click? Oh yeah, yeah. It's for me. It's and the Apple Watch is bad for that because your everything that you do is your timed. Your um, yeah. So for me, I'm very competitive, and I I wish I could turn it off. I wish there was a switch that you could just go. I'm going to play a game of ping pong, and I don't care how I'm going to go, mm. but I just. Everything is a competition. I reckon it's like when I come home, I say to Candice, I'm just going to have an hour's nap. 
And I reckon in the back of her mind, she's got a, a count of how many times I've done it. And she hasn't done it once. Yeah. yeah. So I'm waiting for that day to go, you know. Candace, you don't know how lucky you are. I don't put the red flag. I never put the red flag. We need sleep. No. But I'll tell you something. You're lucky, Candace. I remember once saying to Trish, Trish goes, um, she goes, can you go down to the corner, just get, you know, cauliflower. Some, she's going to make it curry. Uh, some chicken breast and... Anyway, milk. Do you know what goes place. in yeah, a curry? I don't know, actually. I don't know. <laughs> I don't yeah, know coconut, coconut milk. <laughs> anyway, here we got down there. It was a long time ago. It was 22 years ago. Anyway, on the way down there, I caught up with a few mates. And they were going, what are you doing? So anyway, we went in a bit of a bender. And um, <laughs> two days later, I was going to go home. And I thought, do you know what? She'll find this funny. And I got the cauliflower, the coconut milk, and the chicken breast. And the camera said, oh, here it is. Um, yeah, it didn't go oh, good. Oh, that would not go down. Well, I think it was after we gave birth to, well, I gave birth to Ivy. And Dave went and had a few beers at the Royal at Ramwick. And it's like, yeah, yeah, I'll be home at 5.30. 6.30 still wasn't home. 7.30 still not home. I'm like, where are you like i've just had this baby like come on anyway he then brings decides to bring the whole pub back to our house <laughs> yeah. yeah and i'm just like nah that's not going to happen today so i'm pretty sure they had some cases on their shoulders and they end up just drinking them out on the street but i'm like you have got to be kidding me i remember that vividly you have to wet the head like yeah. that is yeah but this is what i don't understand we do all the hard work oh, and then you on. guys get oh, to have all the fun okay hey, hey candace <laughs> let me tell you something you don't know what it's like to have an ingrown tail now i tell you it's okay. oh, that or the so man flu tough. yeah <laughs> the man exactly. flu. That is it's shocking horrible. guys we've taken out too much of your time really appreciate it um you guys are awesome you're Thank a great you. team great people uh dave love the beer too. Give it a plug. Appreciate yeah. it. Uh, St Andrews Beach Brewery down in Mornings Peninsula. Beautiful. If you're down there. Beautiful. And it's going to Melbourne Olympic Park as well. So if yeah. you go down there to watch the Storm play, it'll be opening, yeah. I think, yeah. early yeah. June. That's actually Amy Park. Amy Park. Yeah, yeah. Now, yep. yeah, the old Olympic Park hasn't been around for a while. Yeah. But Amy Park, get down there and watch the Storm play. <laughs> yep. Get yourself a St Andrews. But this, is, you, but this is available at Melbourne Olympic Park. Oh, is it? There's yeah. a bar yeah, there the opening road. up. Oh, is it? At the centrepiece. Okay. Shame on you. Shame on me. Thanks, guys. Cheers. What a tear, Coop. Just good people, working class people. Dave, all rugby league players always say Dave's a rugby league player. Yeah. He was rugby, he, he's a cricket player and a rugby league player's uh, spirit. Yeah. Big thank you to those two. Very open and honest insight. Good uh, people. Yeah, very good people. Yeah. yeah. Very, very good. Uh, really enjoyed it. Like, you see Dave, what a great competitor, why he was so feared, to go to the pitch and just go, I don't care. Yeah, um, even yeah. all the stuff, like he's obviously been through a fair bit of shit, like both of them together, mm. and you just see how mentally resilient they are and how it just sort of brushes straight over them. Although Candace does have a long list of feuds that she's going to attack. And <laughs> she's, she unfurled the thing of grudges yeah. and she's marking them off. It was just a yeah. scroll of <laughs> people just... Well, think about your mother. Yeah, they, you very know. similar. <laughs> they are. Righto, Coops. Very that was, good. That was great. Yeah, Thank you very much. Okay. See you next week. Bye.